Those who go down to the sea in ships are dreamers, and mostly they dream of faster ships. But from the time of Noah to the turn of the 20th century, the speed of boats didn't change much. Not for lack of trying, but because of the limitations imposed by power and materials. Early in the 20th century, something magical happened. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, built a boat that went nearly twice as fast as all the boats and ships that came before it. It was a boat with wings. He called it a hydrodrome, meaning a machine that flew in water. Today, we simply call them hydrofoils. Perhaps there is a point not far beyond where we are now that further conventional boat speed becomes impossible. Most of the energy of boats is spent simply pushing the water out of the way. The drag of a hull in the water drains efficiency. Hydrofoil-equipped vessels are a cross between the boats they look like and the airplanes they're built like. Hydrofoils are wings that fly in water. When sufficient power is supplied, the foils provide enough lift to raise the hull of the boat completely out of the water, eliminating most of the resistance or drag created by the hull in the water. Like an airplane, the hydrofoil wing is shaped like the wing of a bird. But since water is over 700 times more dense than air, hydrofoil wings can be very small. They were originally conceived for high-speed military attack craft. Instead of being beaten by the waves, hydrofoils fly through the calm subsurface of the water. Modern designers utilizing new high-strength materials are putting foils to use on everything from performance water skis to competition sailboats with great effect. The benefit of having a boat that has hydrofoils is that it has less wetted surface so that means it has less drag on the structure and allows the forces generated by the wind to propel the boat at a higher rate of speed. The biggest influence on keeping a boat going slow is the hulls dragging in the water. So if you can remove the hulls from dragging in the water, you have a tremendous power advantage. And that power, gets instead of pushing the boat through the water, is now only pushing the foils through the water. And the foils present much less surface area than do the hulls. So that means you get a tremendous increase in speed potential. The man who's responsible for the path that led to the development of the rave is Dr. Sam Bradfield and his people at Hydrosail in Melbourne, Florida. Sam's been working since the 70s on developing this T-foil type structure for lifting boats out of the water. Dr. Sam Bradfield is the granddaddy of high-speed hydrofoil sailing. A two-time world speed record holder, he's had more success in designing hydrofoil sailboats than anyone else. His rave hydrofoil sailboat design has brought affordable high-speed hydrofoil sailboats to the recreational sailor. A Windrider rave is a trimaran, a boat with three connected hulls. She sails like any normal boat, until the foils reach their takeoff speed. Once up on the foils, a rave will leave everything in its class behind. Sam's rave hydrofoil has enabled thousands to share his love of speed on the water. But as soon as his design work on the rave was done, he was on to more amazing projects. At 84 years old, he is currently working on a 40-foot hydrofoil sailboat called SCAT. SCAT stands for Sam's Crazy-Ass Trimaran, 
because making hydrofoil boats that fly is still an experimental mix of art and science. Young engineers all over the world are working on new hydrofoil boat designs. In some cases, they are using hydrofoils to make ever more efficient use of human power. Here in Midland, Ontario, the students are working on a new hydrofoil that uses the latest recumbent bicycle design. They've enlisted the help of Jake Free, a pioneer in the design of human-powered hydrofoils. Who's calculating the RPMs? 400 RPM. 400? OK. Give me a gear ratio. I have 6.5 pedals over five seconds. What does that tell you? The reading at the bottom of the foil, how high it is, what's that going to tell you? Each stripe is an inch. So I know that, I know that. What's that going to tell you, though? His height of the foil, what's it going to tell you? Um, how much we're lifting, I would think. Tell you how much lift you're going to have, and it's going to tell you what the drag is going to be. Like airplane wings, hydrofoils provide lift. The key to hydrofoil design is the shape of the foil. The arched top of the wing makes the water above it travel faster than the water below it. This creates lift. As power is applied and speed increases, the lifting action of the foils is transferred through the struts to lift the hull of the boat out of the water. This eliminates the drag of the hull and the bumping effect of the waves. In 1991, engineers at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts built a hydrofoil craft called the Decapitator. It can reach speeds in excess of 34 kilometers per hour using only human power. They currently hold the world record for both the men's and women's solo 100-meter run. Halfway around the world, in Mikabe, Japan, these Yamaha engineers are running time trials on Hamanako Lake. The paddle has been replaced by the pedal and the propeller to make the most out of the limited power available from the human body. Once sufficient power is achieved to lift the vessel onto its foils, hydrofoils stack the physics deck in the rider's favor. This hydrofoil, called the Super Phoenix, ran the 100-meter course in just over 10 seconds. They've hit the record books with a new water speed record for a human-powered vehicle. Hydrofoil boats make such an efficient rig that they can be powered to even greater speeds by the sun. This design, called Solan, runs the 100-meter course at over 40 kilometers per hour. The kids at Midland would like to take their water strider for a record run, but first, their dream is to just get it off the ground. It's taken nearly two years of testing and trials to get the water strider to fly. With hard work and perseverance, future innovations could produce a world record-setting machine. And Brittany has a definite shot at the woman's record. She has to go after 11 nuts, right? 13 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah I think so, yeah. That's definitely doable. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, worked for years on tests and trials of his hydrofoil designs. He dreamed of giant sail-powered hydrofoiling ocean liners that could skim across the Atlantic at record speeds safely and cheaply. By 1919, Bell's work with his partner, Casey Baldwin, resulted in a world water speed record using an original hydrofoil design, the HD4. At over 70 miles per hour, it was the first really big increase in the speed of boats in at least 4,000 years. Alexander Graham Bell worked in this house and in his labs nearby for nearly three decades on a wide range of experiments in aviation and hydrofoils and other areas. In fact, his work here led to uh, huge man-flying kites and the first airplanes that flew in Canada were flown on the ice right down there. While he was working on his aviation experiments, um, he came upon the idea in 1901 of thinking, could I build a craft that could go across the water? If I could use aerial propulsion and somehow lift the boat out of the water, I could have a really fast um, watercraft. Casey Baldwin was Bell's confidant, companion, and partner. While Bell would come up with ideas and designs, Baldwin would be assigned the task to construct and test them. K-1 
Casey joined Bell in Cape Breton in 1906, the duo began experimenting with airplanes. For them, this led logically to discussions about hydrofoils. The hydrofoil, in a lot of ways, is, is really an airplane on the water that is able to lift up out of the water and skim across it. And so all their work in aviation really led very logically, segue right into the hydrofoil. Casey was an avid sailor, so of course it was natural that at some point he would try to put a couple of sails on a little dinghy with some hydrofoils and see if it, they could get it to take off. Uh, they tried a double-rigged sailing catamaran, which they called the Nancy, which was probably named after Nancy Fairchild, who was the youngest of Bell's grandchildren, and probably light and lively, which is why they gave it the name, the Nancy. Their test of the ladder-like design consisted of towing models. These trials were plagued with troubles. Although Casey was a trained engineer, he consistently overestimated the strength of the hydrofoil materials and underestimated the forces placed upon them as they tore through the water. Bell wasn't set back by the Nancy's failure. He was a man of vision. He believed that large, ocean-going hydrofoils harnessing the power of the wind could take passengers across the Atlantic more safely and quickly than the lumbering steamers of the day. Like so many of Bell's futuristic visions, this one posed many technical difficulties, some of which have yet to be resolved. A hydrofoil needs power to create the lift force which raises it from the water. A hydrofoil sailboat must harness ample power from the wind alone and efficiently transfer this power through strong materials to create speed. Building a sailboat strong enough to transfer the required power proved to be impossible given the wood and wire materials available to Bell. It was their powered designs based on earlier hydrofoil theory that finally got out of the water in an impressive way. In 1911, Bell and Casey Baldwin went around the world, and while they were in Italy, they saw early hydrofoils by Furlani. There had been people who'd been working on hydrofoils, but really they hadn't been able to go much more than 25 or 30 miles an hour because they would, uh, they would destruct and they weren't stable. Like the Forlanini design they had seen in Italy, Bell and Baldwin used a ladder foil arrangement that would progressively lift the boat out of the water. Most of the work was really done by, by Casey Baldwin, who was Bell's head engineer and, and partner. Uh, but Bell got very excited, and they would have, uh, when I read his journals, I would find entries where they would sort of, one would write an entry, and then the next would write his response, and they would kind of alternate their entries. So they worked very well together. The US Navy were intrigued by the speeds which the early HD models had attained in their tests and they provided Bell with the two 350 horsepower Liberty engines which propelled the HD4 to its record-setting speeds. When Bell and Baldwin finally built their real hydrofoils, they called them hydrodromes, which is why we have HD1. And the final one, HD4, was the one that set the world's record at 71 miles an hour. From the time of Bell's first notes in his uh, journals about hydrofoils in 1901 until the, uh, the HD4 finally really set the world's record in 1919. Uh, there were 18 years of hard work. In fact, some people called it hope deferred. That The HD1 through HD4 really stood for hope deferred, not hydrodrome. It was right down here uh, by 1919, when they got the HD4, that was able to fly across these lakes uh, at 71 miles an hour, which was the world speed record at that time. Bell changed over 4,000 years of history by using internal combustion engines and the amazing hydrofoil design idea that allowed boats to fly. During World War I, the Navy was actively looking for new weapons to combat the menacing German U-boat threat, and Bell thought his HD-4 would be just what the Allies were looking for. He and Baldwin sent the U.S. Navy a proposal that offered two hydrofoil-based submarine chasers. The HD-4 was finally up and, and uh, completing her sea trials in 1919, uh, but by that time, World War I had just ended, and the need for anti-submarine warfare um, had subsided. And unfortunately, the Navy never moved ahead with acquiring the HD-4. This was Bell's last effort at building hydrofoils and his last great invention before he died. The record set that day was a turning point in marine history and held the hydrofoil speed record until 1962. My father was Bell's oldest grandchild, and he was thrilled to come home on leave from the Naval Academy and get to ride on this incredible HD4. Never forgot the experience of roaring across the lake with these two 350 horsepower Liberty engines roaring along, and this thing taking off across the lake.
It must have been quite dramatic for the townspeople to see. Bell never actually flew the HD-4. He ensured that when reporters photographed him in the HD-4 cockpit, he would have Baldwin's son sit with him so as not to give the impression that he actually flew the spectacular craft. None of us could ever figure out why Bell never went on the HD-4 himself. Uh, but his wife, Mabel, who was pretty spunky, decided she wasn't going to pass up this opportunity. So she went down, got on board, and there's a wonderful shot of Alec watching his wife roaring across the lake. I can remember as a boy playing, and my cousins would climb all over the poor old HD4, which was hauled up. Luckily, it was saved for posterity by the beehives in it, and now it's in the Bell Museum across the way. The Bell Museum was built near Bell's Cape Breton home in 1955 by Parks Canada. It serves to commemorate the innovations and discoveries of Alexander Graham Bell, and is visited yearly by thousands from around the world. The museum retrieved the remains of the HD-4, which had been left on the shore, and it also commissioned construction of a replica of the HD-4, which even used some of the original parts, including one of the original engines. The work of Bell and Baldwin proved that hydrofoil boats were possible and that the speeds they could achieve were unlike anything ever seen before. After World War I, the next steps in hydrofoil development would be made by militaries in Europe, Canada, and the United States. Alexander Graham Bell died in 1923. His wife, Mabel, died the following year. As well as being the adventurous HD-4 pilot, she was the business manager of the group. Their remaining partner, Casey Baldwin, took over the hydrofoil business, but he was an engineer and he was never able to make a commercial success of it. The US Navy had lost interest in hydrofoils through the 1920s. Between World War I and World War II, interest in hydrofoil design moved to Germany. Baron Hans von Schertel, after extensive testing in the late 20s and early 30s, collaborated in the building of a number of hydrofoil boats for the German Navy. They used a surface-piercing hydrofoil design. This differs from a fully submerged T-foil because its V-shape causes the tips of the foil to come out of the water. A fully submerged T-foil flies just like an airplane wing. But a surface piercing foil is angled to come out of the water so that it provides progressively less lift as the boat speeds up and lifts from the water. When lift is lost, like when the boat crashes through waves, more of the foil becomes immersed again in water and compensates with more lift. The surface piercing foil continued to be developed and for many years has been the most common type of practical hydrofoil for large vessels because it is more stable than the T-foil. The German Navy worked through World War II to perfect hydrofoils as fast attack boats. Although they were able to achieve speeds up to 41 knots, they came to the conclusion that they were not practical for use in military operations because they could not be used in all sea conditions. It was not until after World War II that the next big leaps in hydrofoil design were realized. During the Cold War, Bell's hydrofoil principles were finally put to use on huge and powerful military hydrofoils. Subchasers, fast attack craft, missile launches, and coastal defense craft. In Canada, experiments with various foil arrangements were done with two small craft, the RX and the 45-foot Massawippi. The Massawippi used Bell and Baldwin's traditional airplane foil arrangement. The RX was used to test the new canard foil arrangement with a small foil in the front and a larger surface piercing foil aft that would carry most of the weight of the boat. A 17-ton vessel called the Bedeck tested Bell and Baldwin's foil arrangement to its limits on a large vessel. Like the German experiments, rough seas played havoc with this foil arrangement. The most stable hydrofoil platform turned out to be the tricycle-like canard configuration of the RX.
The ultimate vessel created from these experiments was a 200-ton vessel named Brodeur, after the lake where Bell conducted his experiments. The Brodeur was a triumph of engineering and technology, but changing priorities for the Canadian government in the early 1970s led them to mothball the great craft. It now resides in a naval museum yard just outside Quebec City. I christen thee Pegasus. The American Navy, through contracts with several innovative companies, developed hydrofoils for use where speed was of the essence. The most highly developed U.S. military hydrofoils were equipped with retractable foils that allowed them to lessen their draft considerably if they were required to enter shallow water during military action. At 212 feet long, USS Plainview was the largest hydrofoil in the world. Built by Lockheed, she needed two gas turbine engines of 14,000 horsepower each to lift her hulking 320-ton hull from the water. Boeing, the world's largest aircraft manufacturer, used its aeronautical expertise and another new technology, water jet propulsion, to transform an already potent design into a high-speed attack dog. One of the largest water jet-powered ships ever built, USS Tucumcari is the forerunner of the modern jet ski. Along with her sister ship Flagstaff, Tucumcari saw active service in a variety of missions, including river patrol in Vietnam. From the early days, U.S. military hydrofoils were equipped with Harpoon missiles, the Navy's basic anti-ship missile. Harpoon missiles have a range of over 60 miles and travel at over 500 miles per hour. And, most importantly, can be fired accurately from a ship traveling in excess of 40 knots. The mainstays of the U.S. hydrofoil fleet were the six PHMs built by Boeing. The 131-foot, 240-ton PHMs carried eight anti-ship missiles and a 75-millimeter rapid-fire gun. With their three water jets propelling them at over 46 miles per hour, they could be an awesome sight during wartime maneuvers. The PHMs were pushed for deployment in the Mediterranean and the Caribbean. Although they had played a part in the U.S. deployment in Grenada, they had not yet proven to the satisfaction of the naval chiefs how they could tangibly contribute to combat environments given their limited range, their expense, and the safety concerns involved. There was always some worry about safety on the big military hydrofoils. USS Pegasus ran aground in 1979 at foil-borne speed and damage was extensive. The crash of the test ship Fresh 1 at a metal ripping 70 knots further raised concerns for safety and reliability and caused the Navy to lower their 100-knot speed goal. They did, however, play a large part in the national counter-drug program in Florida, devoting most of their time to Navy-assisted drug seizures. The PHMs helped in seizing over a billion dollars in drugs, but their operational costs were not funded by the counter-drug program. These awesome machines were popular and more than a novelty, but in 1993, they were finally decommissioned as an unnecessary expense and replaced in their drug enforcement role by conventional coastal patrol craft. Today, with America's new war on terrorism, some military experts concerned with homeland security are again looking to hydrofoils as an effective means to protect America's harbors and coastal waterways. In Russia, a great network of long, straight lakes and waterways creates a perfect liquid superhighway for high-speed hydrofoils. A hydrofoil building tradition developed after the Second World War based partly on hydrofoil knowledge acquired from German scientists. Russia produces more hydrofoils than any other country. They operate mainly as passenger ferries on inland waterways. Today, it is estimated that 80% of the world's passenger hydrofoils are Russian built. Even in the heart of North America's Great Lakes, Seaflight Hydrofoils of Toronto uses Russian-built Volga Catran hydrofoils to ferry tourists to and from Niagara Falls. Once the turbo engines kick in, the ship quickly jumps up on its foils. It looks dramatic, but inside the feeling is imperceptible. The ride just smooths out, giving the feeling of actually slowing down. But as the hydrofoils fly through the water about six feet below the surface, passengers enjoy an airplane smooth ride at 34 knots, while these craft travel above the pounding waves in seas as high as six feet. Russian hydrofoil ferries have proved to be inexpensive and dependable, and they can be found in every corner of the world from the Netherlands to South America.
Alexander Graham Bell's ideas about high-powered hydrofoils have developed into fast, dependable transportation, and his dream of hydrofoil sailboats has not been forgotten. In the 1950s, Gordon Baker and a group of young American engineers and sailing enthusiasts used Bell's principles of angled stepfoils and new high-strength lightweight materials such as fiberglass to realize the dream of sailboat hydrofoils. The first great success was Monitor. Monitor was the first successful hydrofoil sailboat in this country, in my view. And that was designed by a professional group and funded by the Navy. And the Navy was interested in that kind of a search vehicle, noiseless sort of search vehicle in the early 40s. And so they did it and did it successfully. By using hydrofoils, Monitor reached speeds of 38 knots, inconceivable for a conventional sailboat under similar conditions. But at a price of $20,000 in 1957, commercial sails were not possible. This is a main foil for my new sailboat. It's a whopper. Into the 21st century, hydrofoil development continues. The most amazing results have been achieved by combining high-strength materials, hydrofoils, and a quest for fun. Dr. Sam Bradfield's new boat, the 40-foot Scat, is being built entirely from carbon fiber, the lightest and strongest material available for boat building today. If Alexander Graham Bell had this stuff, his hydrofoil sailboats would have flown like the wind. The foils for Scat are being made at Matrix Composites in Melbourne, Florida. You're at uh, Matrix Composites. We've, uh, we've been uh, fabricating aerospace, medical, and industrial composites. Uh, for about eight to ten years now. Carbon fiber is a reinforcement that's used in composites. Uh, it's a, in this case, for the hydrofoil, we're using a unidirectional carbon fiber. The real advantages of the carbon are uh, much higher uh, strengths and stiffness than, than fiberglass materials, uh, while at the same time being about 60% uh, of the weight of fiberglass. So you, the end result is you get a very, very uh, stiff, strong, lightweight structure. Essentially, the orange, the orange portion that you're seeing here is actually a mold um, for creating the shape. Typically, with composites, you're, you're working with some very uh, flexible materials, and in order to get them into position to be cured, you need a, a stiff structure that represents the shape of your part. And of course, the black uh, that you see is the uh, is the carbon fiber being laid into the uh, laid into the mold. One of the things worth noting is that this this particular area in the part, which is the the uh, joint of the, the strut and the foil, um, uh, this is where the, the, the primary loads are, are being, uh, uh, being applied. So the orientation of the fibers to, to carry those loads and to be strong enough not to fail in this area is very, very critical. Once the foils are completed, they will be shipped here to Key West, Florida, where the hulls are being made and assembled at Multi-Hull Technologies, a boat building company specializing in high-end, one-of-a-kind boat designs. It's a very nice shape, and, uh, and it is very light, too. Let me just demonstrate you how light this, uh, this main hull is here. That's... For a 37-foot hull, pretty good. <laughs> the fiberglass construction, we probably save about 30% uh, of the overall weight. But it's, it's not only the, the savings in weight, it's also the gain in stiffness. We, we have uh, the carbon fiber has much less elongation, so we get a much more rigid and stiff platform with less deflection. In rolls like this is how we receive the carbon fiber before we wet it out with the epoxy resin. As you see, these are cut on a 45 degree angle. So we lay up the material into the mold. So we have, we basically make our own triaxial cloth out of unidirectional fiber at 45 degrees this way, 45 degrees this way, and 90 degrees this way. So we have fiber running in three different axes. These here are the, the two outer hulls, not assembled yet. So basically, 
the, the four half hulls that make the two outer hulls. This piece here and that piece.